This is probably one of the most important and illustrative charts I've presented in all of my videos. It presents a view of two possible future scenarios and the potential upside and downside for a person who commits a certain portion of their wealth to precious metals and the balance to financial assets. I'm going to discuss it in detail later in this video, but first I'd like to provide you with the background for its construction so that you can understand the assumptions that went into it. Hopefully I'll be able to get you to a point where you can build one of these yourself with your own chosen assumptions. In my last video titled Sleep Easy Portfolio, I discussed how different portfolios performed for randomly selected 10-year intervals over the last 45 years. This was the central chart presented. The black dots represented the performance of pure asset classes selected. For example, a 10-year treasury note purchased at a random point in time if held to maturity, on average, increased the owner's purchasing power by 3.3% per year, as shown on the vertical axis. However, the return also had a 3.16% standard deviation, which meant that the actual return, depending upon the time that the bond was purchased, could have been 5.1% lower or higher than the 3.3% per year average. In other words, the increase in purchasing power for a 10-year bond selected at a random point in time would have been the 3.3% per year average return, plus or minus 1.6 standard deviations from that average. The curves drawn between the black dots represented blends between the assets. On each curve was a circle representing a 10% move from one pure asset to another. I suggested that a 25% gold and 75% bond portfolio for the past 45 years would have provided the best improvement in a purchase person's purchasing power with the highest degree of predictability. But I don't want to leave it there. I need to elaborate a little bit more. After all, these are past results, and you can't buy the past. You can only buy the future. It is often the case that when patterns are found in the data that point to the opportunity to gain, the act of the masses exploiting the patterns causes an increase in certain asset prices, which necessarily reduces future returns. One case in point is the popular Dogs of the Dow strategy, which after it became popular stopped working as reliably as the past data would have suggested. Another case in point is the fact that for multiple decades since the year 1970, stocks did not perform nearly as well as Jeremy Siegel's book Stocks for the Long Run proposed. So we need to be careful about just blindly applying data from the past. We can certainly use the past as a guidepost in shaping our thinking, but we still need to think. I personally think that the past is most useful for helping us to understand the variability of returns. Gold, silver, and stocks have been highly volatile in the past, and there's good reason to believe that they'll be highly volatile in the future. In the same way, we also know that the precious metals have tended to do well when the financial assets have done poorly, and vice versa and these patterns are likely to persist into the future. What is going to change are the relative returns of the various assets. For example, just because silver performed poorly over the past 45 years relative to gold, stocks, and bonds does not mean that it will necessarily do so in the future. What I would like to do in this video is to teach you how to do some calculations on your own and maybe even construct charts that will help you to make the decisions that are right for you. After all, it's your money, not mine, and not anybody else's. So you need to be the one who feels good about what you do with it. So please follow along. I'm going to show you some math, and it's going to look a little complicated, but I'm sure that if you take some time to study and digest it, it will greatly increase your comfort level with how much of your wealth you put into one asset class or another. So if you're okay with that, please follow along. For those of you <coughs> who are not interested in the math, you might want to stick it out anyway, just to see the last portion of the video, where I discuss a couple of possible scenarios that may play out over the next decade, and how you might position yourself to improve your chances of getting through it okay. So let's get started. One of the keys to understanding predictability is to understand the concept of variance and standard deviation. Notice that I said predictability and not risk. Lack of predictability and is one aspect of risk, but it's certainly not the only one. For example, while bonds held to maturity tend to provide a very predictable return, they are by no means risk-free. 
there is always the possibility of a default or a currency failure, but we'll get to that later. I discussed standard deviation already. Quite simply, if we take a bunch of numbers picked from a random distribution, the standard deviation is the average distance each pick will be from the mean. In the case of a normally distributed random variable, about 90% of your picks will be within 1.6 standard deviations from the mean. The concept of variance is handy when we talk about combinations of random variables. It makes the math easy, primarily because one of the key results is the formula that you see at the top of this page. If we have a bunch of random yet related variables, such as returns from stocks, bonds, gold, and silver, and we want to calculate the variance of results from a weighted combination of these variables, we use this formula. The A's shown as coefficients are simply the weightings assigned to each random variable. In the table, I've summarized the variances for the 10-year real returns of four assets, as well as covariances between them. As an example calculation, consider a portfolio of 25% gold and 75% 10-year notes. Using the formula above, we take 25% squared times the variance of gold, add it to 75% squared times the variance of bonds, and then add the product of 25%, 75%, and the covariance between gold and bonds to obtain the variance of the portfolio. In this case, the variance is 0.033%. The square root of this number is the standard deviation of 1.8%. I've included another example below for a weighted combination of gold, bonds, and stocks, and I'll leave it to you to pause the video if you're so inclined and go through the example. I'd also encourage you to try the calculation with other combinations so that you can see for yourself how easy the concept is. Once you've figured out how to calculate the standard deviation of combinations of asset classes, you are most of the way there to understanding how to create volatility versus return charts for the combination of assets of interest. Let's move on and see one of the practical consequences of the variance formula combined with the covariance table above. Suppose we know that each of the four assets has a tendency to fluctuate in value, but we have no good way of knowing in advance which direction any of them will move. All we know are the characteristic volatilities and how the different asset classes correlate with each other. How can we determine the mix of assets that will be the most stable? It's an important question because the more stable the value of the portfolio is, the less likely it will be that a surprise expense will force you to liquidate your holdings at an unfortunate time. Low volatility portfolios tend to be very predictable. So let's see how we can figure out the answer. Here's where the math gets a little tricky. I won't spend a lot of time covering this material because it requires a little calculus, which is probably not why most of you are watching this video. Besides, you won't need to be able to do the math yourself to understand and appreciate the result. The top three equations describe the rates of change of the variance of the portfolio to changes in the weightings of each asset. If we want to minimize the variance of the portfolio, we have to find the coefficients that drive the variance to the lowest value possible. This means that the rate of change of the variance with respect to each coefficient should equal zero. We also know that the sum of the coefficients should equal 100%. And we also want to come up with a combination that results in all positive weightings. After all, a negative weighting would mean to short one or more asset classes, which is something that I don't condone. Besides, most of you silver enthusiasts would not like uh, which asset uh, the answer to the unconstrained problem would tell you to short. This problem can be solved using the method called the simplex method. The answer turns out to be 22.2% gold, 77.8% bonds, zero stocks, and zero silver. In my last video, I pointed out that graphically, it looked like 25% gold and 75% bonds would be the most predictable portfolio from the value standpoint. The algorithm gives a more precise answer than I came up with before, but it's pretty close. So let's just call the lowest volatility portfolio 25% gold and 75% bonds. It's a nice comfortable starting point for anyone who values stability in a portfolio but does not have any basis for determining which asset class is likely to perform the best over any given period of time. One can certainly make adjustments to the weightings of the assets chosen, but first it is smart to at least do some calculations to verify that the odds will be in one's favor. We'll do that in a moment. 
First though, we need to do just a little bit more math to verify that we can develop an accurate picture. Let's see if we can reconstruct the first chart that I showed. We already know the formula for calculating variance and then standard deviation. For our four assets, I expanded the formula here for you to use if you like. It's not too hard to put into a spreadsheet. All you need to know are the weightings of each asset in your portfolio. But variance and standard deviation alone are not enough. They only tell you what coordinate to use on the x-axis for your given portfolio. You also need to know the expected return. This is important because it is the expected return of the various assets that you will need in order to determine what portfolio is right for you at any given point in time. For now, let's simply take the average 10-year real returns that resulted for the past 45 years for each of the four assets. For gold, it was 3.35% per year. For bonds, it was 3.28% per year. For stocks, it was 3.13% per year. And for silver, it was 1.35% per year. The expected return for a portfolio is simply the 10-year geometric average weighted sum of the returns of each asset class. And the formula is at the top of the page. How do these couple of formulas stack up to a rigorous calculation of returns versus variabilities? The chart on the left was calculated from, a raw return, from the raw return numbers. The chart on the right was calculated using the formulas above. Are they similar enough? I think they are, but you be the judge. Okay, we went through a lot of trouble to get to this point. Why was it important to do so? Well, if you have a good idea of expected return, you can modify the chart so that it gives you insights into the combination of assets that might be best for you. So let's summarize and then move on. We've seen that for the past four and a half decades, a portfolio consisting of 20 to 30 percent gold with the balance in bonds not only provided close to the best average yearly return, but it was also very predictable in terms of performance. It didn't fluctuate wildly. Not only did it uh, outperformed stocks, but it also did so with a variability that was about half of what would have been expected in a bond-only portfolio. The variability was also only about one-fifth that of gold. Talk about a free lunch, huh? But the problem, and I've already alluded to it, is that you can't buy the past. You can only buy the future. The future is unknowable, but we can use the past to provide us some insights into what the future might hold in store. If we know the odds, we can position ourselves in such a way that we won't be hurt too badly if things don't go our way. If we don't know anything about the future returns, then our best bet is a portfolio of 20 to 30 percent gold and the balance in bonds. A person can certainly increase the percentage of gold held and decrease the percentage of bonds held, but it would only be the smart thing to do if a person had a strong belief that gold will outperform bonds in the next 10 years. Remember, there were lots of people who held that strong belief in early 1980, but they were proven to be very wrong over the next couple of decades. One could also choose to add stocks, but again, one should make sure that there is a good reason to believe that stocks will outperform bonds. And the same goes for silver relative to gold. Sure, silver could outperform gold, but one should also consider the potential consequences associated with backing the wrong horse, to borrow a phrase. Most importantly, models can help us to visualize our possible futures. They aren't perfect, but they can help us create pictures that can give us a justification for a personal holding. They can also be used to analyze scenarios to see what would happen if your assumptions turn out not to be right. We can use variances and covariances from the past to estimate the predictability of portfolios into the future. After all, stocks, gold, and silver were somewhat volatile in the past, and it's reasonable to assume that they'll continue to be volatile in the future. Precious metals have tended to do well in the past when financial assets did poorly and vice versa. This is a trend that's not likely to change. What will change though are the expected rates of return. There will be times when these assets are expensive and times when they are cheap. And so we can take that into account by changing our estimated returns. So now, with all that said, let me get to a few of my views of possible future scenarios and show you how I th see risk versus return going forward. You may or may not agree with the assumptions that I make, and that's okay. Now that you have the tools, 
you can change the assumptions and put together your own view of the future, and I'd encourage you to do so and share it with others. Here are three scenarios I can see unfolding into the future. We might call the first one the status quo case, where the next decade follows the same rules as the last four and a half. This is the fairly straightforward case where bond returns can be estimated from the treasury yield curve and the tipped yield curve. We can estimate the rate of return on stocks by using the current S&P 500 dividend yield and the current price relative to the 10-year CPI adjusted earnings. Gold and silver returns we will estimate by assuming that they will revert to typical levels relative to each other and relative to oil seen over the past few decades. The second situation, which will be broken down into two cases, is the economic reset scenario where precious metals reassert themselves in a strong monetary role and act to bring the world economic system more into balance. In one case, we'll assume that gold is the metal that is revalued and silver remains an industrial commodity, simply preserving the holder's purchasing power. In the other case, we'll assume that silver not only participates along with gold in the revaluation, but manages to reattain its old monetary 16 to 1 ratio. I don't personally know what will be in store for silver under the economic reset scenario. I personally think silver retaking a gold to silver ratio of 16 during an economic reset has maybe a, I'll say, 25% probability. Again, you might disagree. If so, you have the tools to redo this calculation. Now, as far as financial assets are concerned, in an economic reset, bonds will take a real beating. Let's assume they lose 90% of their purchasing power. Let's also assume that stocks see the worst 10-year real return observed during the inflationary 70s. With all that in mind, let's do a few quick calculations to see what this all means for the four assets under each of these cases. We'll start with the status quo case. For bonds, we'll just look at the current yield curve. The 10-year T-bond currently yields 2.23%, and the 10-year TIPS has a fixed rate of 0.65%. This means that the market is expecting a real return on bonds of 0.65%, and expects the inflation rate to be the difference between the two yields, or 1.58%. As far as the S&P 500 goes, I calculated the trailing 10-year CPI adjusted earnings to be 77.38. The Schiller P.E. ratio has trended around 15 for many decades and has tended to revert to the 15 number. That means the 1161 level will have a strong pull on the S&P 500. Given its current level of 2110, this means the expected real price change over the next decade should be about minus 5.8% per year. If we add the current dividend yield of 2.15% to this number, we arrive at an expected real rate of return of minus 3.65% per year. Sure, many trend followers will argue with this estimate, but remember that people were also wildly bullish in the late 90s and again in the mid-2000s. Again, if you don't agree with my estimate, that's perfectly okay. Just figure out your own number and do the math with your own estimate. As far as gold goes, I estimate that 17.5 is an equilibrium point relative to oil. If gold reverts to this long-term average, then the expected price inflation adjusted spot price is $835 per ounce. If we buy a retail coin, say a gold maple for $1,170 per ounce, then the rate of real price change over the next decade might be expected to be minus 3.3% per year, assuming that we sell the coin back at close to spot. For silver, we'll assume that it approaches the equilibrium value I calculated for the gold to silver ratio of 63.3. This is the ratio that seems to have had the strongest pull on silver for decades now, and so let's just go with it. At this gold to silver ratio, and assuming the value calculated for gold, we'd have a price inflation adjusted spot price of $13.19 per ounce. If we buy a silver maple for $18.38, and end up selling it back at close to spot at the end of the decade, this will result in a real rate of return of minus 3.3%. One might be surprised that I'm calculating the same rate as for gold since the gold to silver ratio is currently above 63.3. But remember, if you're buying retail silver coins, the markup on the coins will be much higher than for retail gold. Again, you might not agree with my estimates here, and again, that's okay.
I want you to come up with your own estimates, so please, by all means, do some calculations and share what you think is going to happen. Now let's move on to the really interesting scenarios of the economic reset. For bonds, I suggested we just assume a 90% loss in purchasing power in the event of an economic reset. It might not be that bad. On the other hand, it might be even worse. But 90% is punishing enough to give a person a realistic impression of just how much is potentially at risk in bonds, even though they tend to be not very volatile in the current status quo type world. For stocks, I suggested that we take the worst 10-year return from the inflationary 70s. Again, I'm not making a prediction here, I'm just picking out a number that can give us an appreciation for how stocks have performed in a highly inflationary time. The worst annualized 10-year return in the 1970s was actually a 8.8% real loss in purchasing power. Yes, that's right. Stocks can lose in an inflationary environment. I know the common thinking is that stocks can do okay in inflation because companies are able to pass along increases in cost. While well and good in theory, this is not what history has shown. If stocks start from an expensive valuation and costs rise more rapidly than companies can pass them along, then stocks can be a poor way to protect your savings from a general pr price inflation. Gold's performance in an economic reset I've covered in other videos. In this case, we can take as a guideline the value of the Treasury gold relative to Treasury debt prior to the signing of the Bretton Woods Agreement. In the pre-Bretton Woods era, gold in the Treasury always ranged between 10 to 50 percent of the amount of Treasury debt outstanding. Currently, our official debt is 18.5 trillion, and the Treasury claims to own 0.26 billion ounces of gold. We'll just take their word for it, for the sake of doing these calculations. If gold were to revalue to pre bretton Woods levels, then it would require a spot price of somewhere between $7,100 an ounce and $35,600 an ounce. Considering low price bullion coins are now running at about $1,170, this would represent a real 10-year annualized rate of change in the gold price of 19.8% per year. As far as silver is concerned, I mentioned the two scenarios that I'd like to consider. In the first, we'll just assume that silver remains an industrial commodity, in which case it will have a 0% per year real rate of return and simply protect your purchasing power. In the other scenario, we'll assume that the gold to silver ratio approaches its old monetary value of 16 to 1. This would require a silver price of $443.75 per ounce at the revalued gold price of $7,100 per ounce which would be an annualized rate of return of 37.5%. Now, I don't give this scenario a high probability, but I would like to include it for consideration. To summarize all of the cases, I put this table together. The first three columns of annualized returns are simply the returns calculated on the last few slides. They reflect how individual assets might fare over a 10-year period given quite a different set of uh, circumstances. As we should all be aware, none of these scenarios has a 100% probability of occurring. Our fiat money system has only been in place for 45 years, and we certainly have very large levels of debt, so one should consider the possibility that there will be some type of reset, but we can't assign it a 100% probability. There have been many who have in the past, but have time and again been disappointed. So let's consider a couple different probabilities, just for the sake of illustration. Let's assume a 10% probability of an economic reset happening, and also a 50% probability of an economic reset happening. I've included calculated probability adjusted returns in these two columns on the right. You can recalculate them yourselves if you like. Just be careful. Because we're talking about 10-year annualized returns, we have to use a geometric average and not an arithmetic average to get the right answer. Now that I've tortured you enough with the math, let's get to some charts. Now we get to the interesting part. Here's a modification of the chart that I showed you from my last video. It's the case of the status quo. I did not use the rates of return that were achieved in the past for the various assets. I adjusted the expected returns to reflect current price levels and valuations. If the economy holds together, I expect bonds to generate a slightly positive real rate of return 
and gold, silver, and stocks to revert back to their mean valuations as determined from what has been seen over the last 40 or so years. Under this circumstance, there is no real benefit to holding stocks, but there is a benefit to holding some gold and some silver along with the bonds. That benefit being that it will not only provide insurance against an economic reset, but it will also make the portfolio value much more stable. Adding much more than about 25% tends to increase volatility while increasing the chance of a loss in purchasing power. But as we'll see in a minute, the insurance it gives us against an economic reset might warrant doing so. A 50-50 mix of stock and metal might be a low volatility, but in this environment I predict that such a mix will almost guarantee a real loss in purchasing power. Again, this scenario is what can be expected if there is no chance of an economic reset. Let's increase the odds of the economic reset and see how the picture changes. Look how dramatically the picture changes when we admit just a 10% chance of there being a currency reset in the next decade. Now gold and silver become highly valuable holdings. We're still left with the problem though of their volatility. If we need to come up with cash for a big expense over the next decade, then we might be faced with having to sell at an inconvenient time if gold and silver are, are all that we hold. Thus, one might want to consider holding some financial assets just to diversify a little. Notice that in this environment, a 50-50 mix of precious metals and bonds becomes a pretty reasonable position. It has a probability adjusted rate of return of about a percent and a half in real terms and a volatility that's just a little bit worse than a 100% bond holding. Moving further to the left, we could opt for a 25% precious metal holding with the balance in bonds. This would be the minimum volatility holding. It reduces the probability of building wealth in a reset environment, but holds the promise of at least preserving wealth on a probability adjusted basis. Stocks are pretty, a, a pretty clear loser, whether there is an economic reset or not. If we face the status quo, stocks are richly valued now and likely to revert to the mean. If we face an economic reset, they are likely to perform quite poorly, as was illustrated in the 1970s. For this reason, stocks will not be a good pairing with the metals, as bonds are, for the sake of reducing volatility. Now, if you think the odds of an economic reset are 50-50, it changes the picture even more dramatically. You can see that stocks and bonds on a probability-adjusted basis are likely to yield the same return, but stocks are still much, much more volatile and less predictable than bonds. If we add 25% metals to a bond portfolio, we see that it not only reduces the risk, but significantly increases the expected yearly return. In fact, on a probability-adjusted basis, the real rate of return of such a portfolio is expected to be a couple percent per year. Adding more metal to bring the, stock, to bring the mix to 50-50 increases the probability-adjusted return up to a very respectable 7% per year. However, we do pay for that 7% with increased volatility. A 50-50 mix of stocks and metals has a very similar risk and return profile to a 50-50 mix of bonds and metals. Now, it's important to note at this point just how dramatically the picture changes when we include the possibility of an economic reset. This is why it is important to not rely too heavily upon the past for guidance. If we limit our view of the future to what has been revealed in the past, it exposes us to big risks that might hurt us. The key is to select a mix of assets that can serve us well, even in the face of some of these difficult to see risks. And we'll see how to do that in a moment. Just notice that up until now, stocks have been a clear loser simply because at the moment they are very expensive relative to historic norms. Let's complete the picture now and show how the chart changes with a 100% chance of an economic reset. And here it is. For a person who is 100% certain that an economic reset is in the cards, it would be silly to hold anything but a 100% precious metals portfolio. And there are some people out there who are this confident, and that's okay, provided they understand the impact of the assumptions that they are making and the consequences of being wrong. As I've said, there have been lots of people who have predicted an economic reset ever since 1971, and they've been wrong up until now. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying don't hold metals. Quite the contrary. I'm a big fan of precious metals.
I just think that people have to take probabilities into consideration when deciding just how heavy, heavy a position to take. Personally, like, what I like to do is position myself in such a way that it maximizes the likelihood that my savings will grow in purchasing power and minimizes the likelihood of having an unacceptable loss. And with that said, let's get back to the teaser chart that I put up at the beginning of this presentation. I just showed you with the last four charts that stocks will probably not be a good holding right now simply because of the current valuations. And I cannot see a circumstance in which they can be used to satisfy my goal of increasing my wealth and predictably, predictability simultaneously. Bear in mind that I'm taking a 10-year uh, view. I can be proven wrong over the next week, month, or maybe even the next couple of years. I just believe that the odds disfavor stocks greatly over the long run. Others might disagree, and that's okay. They can run their own scenarios, and I've provided the tools for doing so. The past few charts also showed that somewhere between a 25 and 50 percent metals holding with the balance in bonds seems to provide a good balance of predictability and preservation of wealth at current metals prices. And I'll get to how to adjust things with regard to metals prices in a future video. But unfortunately, the charts used a probability weighted average of outcomes. And we don't live in a world where we can straddle the two outcomes. We will either see one or the other, but not both. Let me show you various mixes of gold and bonds and how they might work out given two discrete scenarios. One where we muddle along in the current status quo and the other where we see an economic reset. Now we come back to the chart that I showed you as a teaser in the intro to this video. On the x-axis I plotted the weighting given to gold. The balance will be in bonds. The two colored regions on the plot show the 90% confidence intervals for the real rates of returns that I predict for the next decade for holding that mix of assets. In one shaded region is the range of outcomes that will be observed in the event that the next decade remains status quo. The other region is the range of outcomes I think might be observed if we see an economic reset. You'll notice that there is a dashed line in the middle of each region. That corresponds to the most likely return for a given mix. Why such a wide band around these dashed lines? Well, as I've said before, each asset mix has its own associated standard deviation of returns. It is 90% likely that the rate of return will be within 1.6 standard deviations of the expected value. And as the standard deviation grows larger, as it does when we go towards the pure gold side, the envelope of potential outcomes increases. Before proceeding, I should make it clear that these are expected returns if one starts by buying a mix of assets and holds it for 10 years without rebalancing. And this is a very important thing to note. Many people in the financial industry propose that you rebalance your portfolio every year. I don't prescribe to that notion when it comes to the precious metals. First of all, doing so increases your taxes and your trading costs. But most of all, think of it this way. In an economic reset scenario, bonds will not necessarily lose value all of a sudden. They may do so in a protracted sawtooth type pattern over time. And if this happens, and you are constantly selling your gold in an attempt to keep things in balance, then your losses will largely be unconstrained. No, I personally think that the better approach is to never sell your gold or silver if you don't have to. If things get out of balance, then commit new savings to the undervalued fund if you are convinced that it's not on the treadmill to oblivion. Now with that said, Consider that we'll likely be facing one scenario or the other. You simply can't live in both worlds. And if you guess wrong and are too heavily committed, then you might get hurt. What we can see here is that in the status quo world, bonds are certainly preferred over gold, at least at current gold prices. This doesn't mean that gold can't outperform bonds. Look at the wide range of potential outcomes on the right-hand side of this chart. A pure gold position based upon volatility seen in the past, can increase a person's purchasing power by 10% per year, even in the world of the status quo, and even with the relatively high gold prices relative to oil that we're seeing currently. But on the, same, on the other hand, it can also decrease wealth by up to 18% per year. This is a big range of outcomes, 
somewhere between 10 and 30 percent gold would be appropriate if we knew for sure that we were going to be in the status quo world for the next 10 years. The problem is that we can't really be sure. Look at the turquoise region. If we hold less than 10 percent gold and it turns out that we have an economic reset, then we're probably going to get hurt pretty badly. If on the other hand we hold 20 percent gold, we're facing roughly the same outcome whether the future world is status quo or economic reset. In other words, a 20 to 25 percent allocation to gold not only minimizes volatility in the current status quo world, but also provides us with enough insurance that an economic reset won't hurt us. And because of the 20 to 25 percent allocation, we don't have to be right about the odds of which future scenario we have in store. We can certainly increase our allocation to gold if we think that the odds of a reset are high. One caveat, though, is that as we get above the 40 percent position, given current price levels, we could be facing significant losses in the current status quo world, simply from the combination of the mean reversion and volatility. And of course, if gold prices were cheaper, I'd probably have a different stance than I do right now. So that's all there is to this video. If you stuck with it this long, congratulations. I really hope it was worthwhile for you. I'd encourage you to do some calculations of your own and start some discussions here. I'd be curious what you come up with. Until next time, take care.